all aboard the corpse train at number 10. Back in the early 1900s, at the dawn of the age of the London Underground, back when escalators were wooden and trains were creepier, there was a decidedly scary rumour going around. A lot of people swear that there used to be a special train that transported corpses from the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel to morgues in the city. This makes a lot of sense because not only would it have been quicker, it also would have spared Victorian era Londoners exposure to sickness and disease. Now, the plague might not have been rife at that time, but other nasties were. Adding substance to the legend of the corpse train, a lot of people swear there's a bricked up tunnel at Whitechapel, saying it's the old entrance to the corpse train route. On top of that, there is also an abandoned station nearby called St. Mary's on Whitechapel Road. Anyway, a lot of people think that the lost souls on board the corpse train still haunt Whitechapel Station. Whitechapel, man, it was a spooky area. It was also the old stomping ground of Jack the Ripper. Speaking of Jacks, we've got another Jack at number 9. We've got Spring Healed Jack. Do we like a leaping demon? No, no, we don't. Say it with me now. This beastie was an urban legend back in Victorian era in London. Why they needed urban legends when they had legit killers and nasty illnesses, I don't know. But hey, those Victorians needed to get their rocks off somehow. Reports of Spring Heel Jack popped up in 1837 amid a spate of weird attacks around Clapham Common. Mary Stevens was walking to Lavender Hill through the park when a figure leapt out at her. He kissed her and ripped off her clothes with claws. Mary described him as cold and clammy. The girl the girl's screams caused the man-like creature to spring away. The next day, a man fitting the attacker's description was seen jumping in front of a carriage, causing it to crash. He then reportedly escaped by jumping over a nine-foot wall whilst laughing, garnering him the name spring Jack in the media. The light-footed devil was officially recognised by the Lord Mayor of London on the 9th of January 1838. Further sightings and reports cropped up in newspapers, including a much publicised attack on the 19th of February. This attack happened on two women, and one described him as vomiting blue and white flames while his eyes resembled red balls of fire. Goodness gracious. My favourite is the 1867 illustration of the devil, it's pretty good. Now, the devil seemed to move from London up to the northwest of England. He was last spotted in Liverpool in 1904. Coming into number 8, we have the sad tale of the crying girl at King's Cross Station. This is a very, very sad tale indeed, but some say King's Cross Station is haunted by the spirit of a crying young woman. On the evening of the 18th of November 1987, there was a truly horrifying fire on the Piccadilly Line escalator at King's Cross Rail Station. At this time, the escalator was made of wood and the grease under the contraption made it a fire hazard waiting to ignite. And ignite it did. A match was dropped down the side of the escalator, spreading a major blaze that burned so hot the ticket office floor melted and collapsed. 31 people brutally died in the blaze with a further 100 injured. Those who died did so horribly. They say that a traumatic death is a ghost maker, and 31 people had just that. The spirit of the crying woman is the most regularly spotted ghost in St Pancras. In 1998, a man spotted a distressed woman crying into her hands. When he went over to ask if she was okay, he passed straight through her. This is just one of many sightings of the crying girl. Some say they've seen a woman with long brown hair screaming with her arms outstretched, and when they go to a sister, she simply isn't there. Now, I've been through that area of the building several times, and there's a little memorial to the victims, which is very sweet. I've never seen a ghost, but I have to admit there is a kind of stomach wrenching sadness that fills me every time I walk down that corridor. Coming into number seven, we have the Phantom Bus. Around Cambridge Gardens in Ladbrook Grove, there is a rogue number seven bus that haunts the streets at 1:15 a.m. A night bus. Hands up, all the night bus warriors of London town out there. Oh my god, the night bus. In the days before the late night tube, the night bus was the only way to get home, and honestly, it was a pretty savage place to be at 1 a.m. Anyway, I digress. The only savage in this story is the Phantom Bus. The otherworldly apparition came about in 1930 when it caused a nasty accident. A driver was motoring down the road when he swerved to avoid something oncoming. The man then crashed his car into a wall and died as his car burst into flames. Eyewitnesses say they saw a bright red London double-decker bus with the number 7 on it hurtling down the road. The dead driver swerved out of its path. Police investigated but they found no scheduled bus at that time of night, and the area didn't have a number 7 bus on its route at all. More accidents happened in the same spot with remarkably similar eyewitness accounts. The same number 7 bus, same 
came out of control careering down the road. Okay, I love this one at number six. We have Sir Francis Bacon and a half plucked chicken. This won't be the last time that Highgate is mentioned on this list. The ghost of famous English philosopher Sir Francis Bacon is said to haunt Pond Square in Highgate, North London. His ghost is accompanied by a chicken, because why not? Now, Sir Francis Bacon died after catching pneumonia when he tried to stuff a chicken with snow in the street in order to experiment with freezing as a way of preserving meat. The events of the 17th century clearly had an impact on the area, and many people have reported seeing bacon and a fowl running amok around Pond Square. Most famously, a couple in the 1970s were snogging on a bench when their kissing sesh was disturbed by a rogue chicken that seemed to disappear into a wall. Coming into number five, we have the headless ghost of Tower Green. Tower Green is within the Tower of London, and to be honest, the ghosts of the Tower of London could make up the entire 10 point list. So I'm gonna go and keep it simple with a lesser known ghost of the castle. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Lady Margaret Pole, the eighth Countess of Salisbury. It seems her son offended King Henry VIII, but he was out of the country, so he exacted his revenge on his mother instead. Lady Pole was 70 years old at the time, which was pretty ancient in Tudor days. On her execution day, she refused to lay her head upon the block, so the executioner swung his axe at her instead. Unfortunately, instead of lopping off her head, he hit her in the shoulder. She ran around screaming and pouring blood until he finally caught her. Now, it took him 11 blows to finally finish her off, and actually, it's pretty, pretty gruesome. It's said on the anniversary of her death, May the 27th, 1541, her ghost runs around screaming around the area, enacting her last moments on Earth. Coming into number four, we have the spirits of Epping Forest. Ooh, Epping Forest, you would not catch me there alone at night, it's pretty murdery. The forest is haunted by such a large number of spooks, it's hard to pick just one. One of the more famous ghosts is highwayman Dick Turpin, who used to use the forest as a base for his illicit activities. The ghost of the criminal, eventually hanged for his years of wrongdoing, presented himself to ghost hunter Yvette Fielding in an area he used to hide out in in the forest. In the 1960s, there were reports of ghostly figures emerging from a pond in the forest near Lindsay Street. Others say a pond deeper in the forest draws in potential suicide victims, as it was once the scene of a murder-suicide between two young lovers over 300 years ago. Another spirit is said to draw cars up a road on a hill just outside the forest. Coming into number three, we have 50 Berkeley Square. 50 Berkeley Square is supposed to be the most haunted house in Britain, let alone London. The home dates back to the late 18th century and has a very haunted attic. It is said that a young woman threw herself out of the attic window after being abused by her uncle for years. Her spirit is said to take the form of a brown mist and is capable of scaring people to death. Between 1859 and early 1870s, a recluse called Mr. Myers lived and died in the house as he went slowly mad. People who have stayed at the property, including Lord Littleton, have claimed to have seen the ghost aplenty. Littleton even shot at one once. The house was a particular focal point in the late 1800s when Mayfair magazine ran a piece about a maid who went mad and died after working at the house. Also, there were stories of two sailors dying emerging at the property. The property is currently the oldest unaltered building in London, and with private owners, little is known about the latest hauntings. Coming into number two, we have the most haunted theatre in London. The stories of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane have gone on for centuries. There are so many urban legends here. Now, the theatre is the oldest theatre in London, as well as being the most haunted. It's been on the same spot since the 16th century, but it has burned down twice. Now, theatres are highly emotional places and are regularly at the centre of hauntings. Drury Lane has a whole bunch of ghosts including a mysterious man in grey, a famous clown Joseph Grimaldi, pantomime dame Dan Leno, and some say that Madame Two Swords herself sits in the aisle cradling a waxwork head. I worked in London theatres and a number of my friends at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane had experienced the man in grey first hand. Now apparently, seeing him on opening night of a new show is supposed to be very good luck, and he reportedly appeared on the first night of Miss Saigon, one of the most successful musicals to ever run on the West End and Broadway. The man in grey loves the theatre and is said to regularly shush noisy patrons. The ghost of the clown is less helpful, however, he's said to kick actors on the stage. Get out of here, Grimaldi! Finally, at number one, we have possibly the most talked about London legend. We have the urban legend of the Highgate Vampire. The 
Highgate Vampire is one of the most popular and credible London urban legends. Practically everyone who lives in the city or has ever lived in the city knows about it. The Highgate Vampire caused a media stir in the 1970s when there was a slew of supernatural activity in Highgate Cemetery in London. The legend started on a cold December night when a cult lover spent the night in a cemetery and glimpsed a grey figure. Since then, a spectre has been seen stalking the graveyard at night. The story goes that the occult lover awoke a sleeping spirit of a Romanian vampire. The vampire was a medieval nobleman who practiced dark magic in medieval times and his body was brought to England in a coffin in the early 18th century and then buried in Highgate Cemetery. The story and sightings led to mass media coverage and mobs of vampire hunters swarmed the gates of the graveyard. It seems the ghostly apparition may live on. The so called vampire was last spotted in 2016 and was possibly caught on camera in 2012. Starting us off at number 10 are the Ravens. Whilst doing my research, the legend of the Ravens was proclaimed the most infamous one, so I thought I'd just start with that one. Apparently, Ravens live inside the walls of the tower, and as we know, Ravens can symbolise death or bad luck. Legend has it that if the Tower of London Ravens are lost or fly away, the crown will fall and Britain with it. It was actually taken so seriously that the tower employed a raven master whose sole job was to take care of them and make sure there were at least six ravens inside at all times. Can't be too sure, you know, those pesky rascals will just fly away. The rumours have circulated that they have their wings clipped so they can't fly, and yes, the raven master does trim their feathers so they can still fly, but not super far. During World War II, most of the ravens in the tower were killed due to bombing raids, but two survived, Grip and Mabel. But Mabel flew away, and that depressed the hell out of Grip, who eventually flew away as well. This small incident was reported in the British newspapers, and soon after the story broke out, the decolonization of the British Empire started, which confirmed the legend to most people. Coming in at number 9 is the bear. Since the tower used to be a menagerie at one point, we know that countless exotic animals were kept within its walls. Apparently some of the animals still haunt the place, and for some reason that really doesn't surprise me. At this point, nothing really surprises me, if we're going to be honest. Either way, guards at the tower have heard the roars of lions at night echoing around the tower. Some have seen the ghosts of horses galloping outside on the cobblestones with glowing red eyes, but the scariest one had to be the bear. In the 1800s, E.L. Swift shared that a sentry at Martin Tower was terrified by this huge bear-like figure that appeared from underneath the door. He shot his bayonet at it only for the bullet to go through the door and hit nothing at all. The bear was supposedly massive with his mouth fully agape and dripping with saliva. The ghost was salivating. Why is that so weird to me? The sentry literally dropped to the ground in fear and died two or three days later. Over time, people believe the bear was just the devil in disguise, which I kind of agree with. I don't remember the last time someone just died from seeing a ghost. At number eight, we have the key. Now, you'd think it'd take years of planning, like the show Money Heist, to pull off stealing something from the Tower of London, but it turns out it does not. Back in 2012, a man somehow breached the walls of the tower and stole the only set of spare keys to the tower from a sentry box used by the yeoman warders. Now, the warders are the ceremonial guards of the tower and have locked it up every night without fail for the last 700 years. But somehow a man entered and although he was caught trespassing and escorted off the premises, he still got the keys. So someone somewhere in the world has the only other set of keys to the Tower of London and we have no idea who it is. But they're sitting on a lot of money, you know, the crown jewels, etc. Just saying. You can liquidate those assets. Filling out number 7 slot is the Koh i Noor diamond. Can we just have a moment of silence for the fact I will never see a diamond of this size? Thank you. The tower houses the British crown jewels, and that includes the Koh i Noor diamond, aka the largest, most cursed diamond in the world. This 186 carat diamond had a curse that only affects men. Hindi descriptions of the diamond said, He who owns this diamond will own the world, but will also know all its misfortunes. Only God or woman can wear it with impunity. The name is Persian for Mountain of Light, and it went through many hands in its time. Shah Jahan, the emperor who commissioned the Taj Mahal, had it, but his reign ended with his four sons torturing and and killing each other. Apparently, it was initially close to 800 carats, but a Venetian gem cutter reduced it to 186. 800 carats? What does that even look like? Well, that be that's huge. Sorry, 
I just imagined. <laughs> it was in the hands of many local rulers, almost all of which met with bloody deaths. Finally, in 1849, a treaty was signed and the stone was given to Queen Victoria. But the story doesn't end there. On its journey to England, there was an outbreak of cholera on board, so locals in Mauritius threatened the crew and told them to leave the port or they'd attack. A storm then occurred, lasting 12 hours, and then finally, finally, it somehow made it to the royals. As a result of the curse, no male heir has ever worn it, and you'd probably keep it that way. It's for the best. Now, at number six is Anne Boleyn. So, a bit of a history lesson for you. Anne Boleyn was King Henry VIII's second wife. This Henry was a fat ass one with eight wives that he either kept divorcing or beheading. <laughs> you know how men can be. The fun fact we actually did a performance of the Tudors in Henry VIII when I was in year six, and I played Jane Seymour, his third wife, and the person he leaves Anne for. So, I mean, I feel like everything just came full circle, you know what I mean? Honestly, it didn't. I just wanted to plug myself. <laughs> Either way, by October 1533, Henry accused Anne of adultery with five courtiers, including her own brother, and treason for apparently conspiring with the men to kill him. None of it was true, but of course Henry was ready for his next wife, so he had to get rid of Anne somehow. She was sent to the Tower of London and decapitated in May of 1536 at age 35. Since she died in the tower, it's literally a given that her ghost had roamed the grounds, like this is no surprise to anyone. There have been countless sightings of her ghost, the most infamous story coming from a captain of the guard. One night he saw this light flickering inside the chapel royal, which was suspicious since it was locked. He tried to find the source of the light by climbing a ladder and saw inside the chapel an entire procession of ladies and knights dressed to the nines. The leader of the event was Anne Boleyn. Another sighting occurred in 1864 when the lieutenant confronted this white female figure. When he stuck his bayonet into the figure, he was horrified to see the weapon going through the figure instead of touching flesh. That's what a ghost is, lieutenant. Study up. Coming in at number five is buried treasure. If X marks a spot, I'm ready with my shovel metal detector, my friends. I'm in need of some buried treasure, let me tell you. Let me tell you. I've just done way too much online shopping and I'm broke. Anywho. So when Oliver Cromwell became Lord Protector of England back in 1653, he told the tower's lieutenant Sir John Barkstead to hide 20,000 gold coins somewhere on the grounds. People have searched the premises and it's every nook and cranny for the treasure, but all have failed. 15th century, 20,000 gold coins. I wonder how much that is in pounds sterling today or even Canadian dollars. I have an overdue England trip coming up anyway, so I mean, you guys will know where to find me. <laughs> Lamau. There. With my metal detector. <laughs> Number four are the Yeoman Warders, also known as Beef Eaters. Established in 1485, these people, as previously mentioned, are the ceremonial guards of the tower. Their job entails living on the premises, locking everything up every night, guarding the gates, as well as the royal prisoners. All warders are retired members of the armed services, and in order to get the job, you have to be a former warrant officer, class one or two, it doesn't matter, and they have to have served in the regular armed services for at least 22 years. As of 2018, there are 37 Yeoman Warders and one chief warder, and of course we cannot forget about the Raven Master. The Tower of London is actually a little village in and of itself. It has a pub, a church, a private doctor's surgery, and more. So most of the warders and their families live inside the fortress. On one hand, I feel like living at the tower could be very cool, but on the other hand, given how many people have died there and the ghosts that plague the grounds, I don't know if I'd want my kids just running around, running into Anne Boleyn's headless ghost, you know? I think that's what you need years of intense therapy to get over as a child. Filling our number three slot is the R. So one of the tower's most popular exhibits is King Henry VIII's old armor, and I don't know if it's the most popular because it was Henry's or because it's possessed by an evil ass ghost. Probably the latter. Either way, over the years, several different people have described this feeling of complete dread going through their bodies as soon as they enter the chamber. The chamber being where the armor is kept. One guard claimed he felt like he was being crushed alive as soon as he stepped inside. Others have said it feels like a demon has just come out of nowhere and is trying to suffocate you. Some have described it as this invisible monster trying to strangle them to the point they could feel this grip around their neck and legitimately could not breathe until they left the room. One guard shared that he was assaulted by a ghost that wrapped his cloak around his neck and tried to strangle him. He escaped from the chamber, but there were red marks all over his neck, meaning that was real. Now, at number two is Traitor's Gate. This is the tower's most famous entrance and was constructed way back during the reign of Edward I. When the arch was first built, it was a brilliant. Workers were pleased, Edward was pleased, but when they came back to it the next day, they found the arch completely collapsed. Furious, the king ordered them to build it once again, and they did, but again, the archway somehow collapsed. You think it was an issue in the construction or foundation, but locals reported seeing the ghost of Thomas Beckett. He was murdered in Canterbury a century prior 
prior, and people saw him still in his bishop's regalia, removing one brick from the arch at a time. This man has patience, I'll give him that. One brick at a time? How much time do you have? I mean, he's in purgatory, so I mean, all the time in the world, I guess. <laughs> Either way, when King Edward was told the news, he ordered his men to build the arch again, but this time, he renamed it to St. Thomas's Gate, and surprisingly, it was still standing the next day. And finally, at number one are the two princes. In the early 1220s, that sounds really weird, but I'm just gonna go with it, King Henry VIII expanded the main castle by adding the bloody tower, even though at the time, it was called the Garden Tower. Flash forward 200 something years, we have King Edward IV. When he died, his two sons, Edward V and Richard, Duke of York, were sent to live in the Tower of London because their uncle, Richard III, was gonna look after them. He then snaked everyone by taking the throne for himself, and the boys literally vanished in 1483. Now, there are many legends surrounding what happened to the boys. Most just claim the boys got murdered in the tower, and I'd agree. In 1674, some workmen were destroying a staircase in the White Tower, but they ended up finding the bones of two children underneath. They were believed to be the two princes, and the bones were transferred to Westminster Abbey. By 1933, the bones were exhumed, and tests indicated they belonged to kids the same age as the princes. Regardless, it's said that the two boys haunt the bloody tower. Back in the 15th century, two guards saw the shadows of two small figures just running down the stairs. They were holding hands and wearing white nightshirts. You guys have heard me say this so many times before, I just hate ghost kids. Kid ghost? Not a thing for me. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the corpse train. Now according to London folklore, in the early 1900s, there was a train that ran underneath the city and it was only for dead people. Back then, London's hospitals and morgues were struggling to deal with the vast amount of people that were dying from poverty and disease. They decided to transport the bodies out of the city, but knew that they couldn't do it overground without disturbing a lot of people. So they used an existing train line to load the bodies onto. The train ran just the other side of a wall from the normal daily service, where unsuspecting Londoners were getting on and off their trains, unaware of the nearby bodies. Next up at number 9 now, we have the suicide pool. This one comes from Epping Forest near Essex. The story goes that years ago, a young couple in love were followed to a pond in the forest by the girl's father. When the couple finally embraced, the father leapt from the trees to confront the boy. The fight got out of hand, and the father ended up killing the boy in a rage at the edge of the pool. The waters then turned black. Wildlife that was touching the water died instantly. In the years that followed, bodies started to appear in the water. First, it was an old woman, then a young one with her young child beside her. They say the pool drew them into their death, and that the pool is still out there in the forest somewhere, waiting for its next victim. Next up at number eight now, we have Annie. This one comes from Edinburgh, Scotland. In the old town there lies a street known as Mary King's Close. It's steeped in myths and legends of hauntings and murders. In 1990, a psychic called Aiko Gibo visited and felt a small hand touch hers. She said that she then made contact with the spirit of a dead child called Annie, who had died in a plague hundreds of years ago and had lost her doll. The psychic then went to a nearby shop and brought back a Barbie doll for her. Now, since then, visitors leave dolls for Annie, and a mountain of them has built up in the dark. Moving on to number seven now, we have the faceless woman. This one comes from the borough of Barking in London. There, you can find Beacon Tree Station, home to the faceless woman. The most famous site of her happened in 1992. A station supervisor reported that on one night, he heard the handle of his office door rattle. Outside on the platform stood a woman. She had blonde hair, she wore a very pale dress, and just stared into the distance. The supervisor approached her, but as he reached out, she turned to him only to reveal she had no face. Just darkness where there should be one. Local ghost hunters claim that she is the victim of a train crash that happened there in 1958, which killed 10 people. At number 6 now, we have The Beast. England's Hackney Marshes is known for its sprawling woodland and boggy reed marshes, often covered in swirling fog, the perfect setting for this urban legend. The story goes that in 1980, two bear carcasses were found in the river. They had been decapitated. People started speculating about who or what could cut a bear's head clean off its shoulders. Shoulders. Then, a year later, four boys were taking a walk along the marsh one winter morning when they saw it through the trees. They described it as a giant, great, growling, hairy thing. As soon as it saw them, it reared up on its back legs and let out a deafening roar. The boys ran, but the story remains always in the back 
of people's minds as they trudge through the marsh. We're returning now to the London Underground for our number 5 with The Crying Girl. On November 18th 1987, a match was dropped on an escalator at London's King Cross Station. A fire quickly spread into the nearby ticket office which resulted in the death of 31 people. In the years since then, passengers have reported seeing a girl who died around the station. She has long brown hair, wears jeans and a t-shirt and is always crying. Some people have even reported hearing her sobs while smelling smoke coming out from the escalators. Back to Scotland now for our number 4 with Sawney Bean. This is the gruesome tale of Alexander Sawney Bean, a man who was said to be the head of a Scottish clan of cannibals in medieval times. According to legend, the group was made up of his wife, their 14 children and 32 grandchildren, some of whom were born through incest. They lived in a cave by the water and would ambush people on the road at night. They would bring their bodies back to the cave to then dismember and eat them. Any leftovers were pickled in a jar for later. When King James VI of Scotland eventually heard of these murders, he led a manhunt to capture them. The clan was caught and then executed. Some people say you can still find the cave along the Benane Head area of Scotland. Moving on to number 3 now, we have Cane Hill. Some say this is one of the most haunted places in England. It was a mental asylum for over a hundred years from 1882 to 1991. It built up a reputation for abandoning some of its patients, hiding them away from the public eye and never truly helping them. Some people say the patients who died left their energy behind there because of their tortured lives. The building was gutted by a mysterious fire in 2010. Perhaps the scariest stories of all are of the faces appearing by the burnt out windows. Next up at number 2 now we have the House of the Screaming Skull. This one comes from Bettiscombe Manor in Dorset, England. The legend goes that in 1830 a man lived there called John Frederick Pinney. He had a slave that he had brought back from the Caribbean island of Nevis. The man became ill and on his deathbed he swore he would never rest unless his body was returned home to Nevis. Pinney refused to pay for that expense and when he died he had the man buried in the local graveyard. After that, ill fortune began to plague the village for months. Screams and cries were heard from the cemetery. At the manor house, windows rattled and doors kept slamming. The body was dug up and brought to the manor house where today only the skull remains where it's said to haunt the manor but the village remains safe. And finally at number 1 now we have the Hellhounds. Dartmoor is a vast, rocky, windy and mysterious part of England. It's popular among tourists but everyone who goes there is aware of the legend of the Hellhounds. It's said that a pack of these ghost dogs wanders the moors at night, preying on sheep and they're not afraid of humans. They've often been described as cat-like but with the frame of a bear and very fast. There have been pictures and film taken of them over the years that claim to show glimpses of these hellhounds in action. Many of the locals don't even need that though. They've heard the stories handed down from generation to generation. Some of them even say they've seen the hounds with their own two eyes. Thank you.